Hey, good afternoon. Jeff Cavins with you again to answer questions that you have this week about uh, the Bible in a year. Father Mike Schmitz and I are going through the Bible in a year, and uh, we are getting towards the end of the Old Testament, and there are still some questions that people have that kind of go back and look at some issues earlier. And so we want to take some time to talk about that. Hey, again, I want to encourage you that if you feel like you are behind in reading or listening to the Bible in a year, you are not alone. Everywhere I go, people say, oh, I love that Bible in a year. I'm a little behind. And I always say, that's fine. That's totally fine. You just keep going. You're going to end at some point. And we're hearing from a lot of people and uh, Bible study groups that people are going to do it again. And I think that that is absolutely fantastic because once through the Bible is great, but to make it a lifestyle is even better. And I have found over the years, and I've been teaching the Bible for over 40-some years now, and I find that every time I go through it again, I always learn more. And I'm surprised at how many, how many times I forgot things, you know, from 15, 20, 30 years ago. And I, I, I go through it again and look at my notes and look at the, the markings in my Bible, and I think, wow, I totally forgot that. So... Keep going. You're doing a great job. All right, we have some great questions this week. One of the questions is about this whole issue of dietary laws in the Old Testament, specifically the kashrut, or the kosher laws. What is kosher, and why so much emphasis on dietary laws? I think what they're asking is, what's wrong with a BLT? <laughs> I think that's what they're probably asking. Okay, so uh, let, let's look at this uh, from the broad perspective first. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there are, there are 613 commandments that are given in the Torah, and the Jewish community believes that Moses received 613 commandments. There are 365 negative commandments, don't do this, and then there's 200, and, I think it's 248, 248 commandments, do this. And they kind of compare that with uh, one, don't do this for every day of the, of the year. And then 248 is, is uh, historically ascribed to the number of bones in the body. <clears throat> so there's this idea of, of uh, you, you respond to the Torah with your whole life, with every bone in your body. Now, there are laws that uh, are dietary. In fact, if you go back and you look at the number of uh, laws that are relating to dietary issues, it's, it's significant. And when Israel was destroyed, or Judah was destroyed in 587 BC, and the Babylonians took them into Babylon, everything changed at that point. And uh, no longer did they have the temple, they didn't have the sacrifices, and so the kitchen table became really the central place where we can sacrifice. And so what you eat, how you eat, when you eat, when you eat, with who, all of this becomes uh, very important and also a way to worship God. And uh, so let's look at this for a second. There are two different things that I, I would mention to you about the, the laws of kashrut, the kosher laws. Uh, and by the way, I think kosher food is phenomenal. When I go on flights, I get kosher because uh, it's just prepared so well. Uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 1 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. So what, what God is going to do is going to tell them the animals that they can eat and then the animals that they cannot eat. He says, whatever parts, the hoof and the cloven footed, and choose the cud among the animals, you may eat. So you may eat those that have uh, a hoof, that is, it's a cloven foot, and they chew the cud. A cow, for example, chews the cud, uh, or a goat or sheep. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, and you shall not eat these, the camel, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof is unclean to you, and the rock badger, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And so you could say then, what about a pig? Well, a pig has a cloven hoof, but it does not chew the cud. And so BLTs are out at that point. 
So the, the, the whole kosher laws really began with this idea that we're going to eat differently than the neighboring nations, which, by the way, I think is actually a good idea that the, what we eat, how much we eat, should say something about the discipline in our life and what's important in our life and that our, our, we don't eat to, uh, we don't live to eat, we eat to live. Our body is a temple, not an amusement park. I digress. So we have this, uh, this uh, split between the animals that you can eat and the animals you cannot eat. And when it comes to fish, it has to have the fins and the scales in order for you to eat it. So you, you wouldn't eat shellfish, for example. That would be non-kosher. Now, typically, these are like bottom feeders. And, uh, and I think that there's a, there's a healthy dietary guideline when it comes to the kosher laws. But when we talk about the kosher laws, there is a whole group of of things that are, are very, very important, like, for example, how you kill the animal, um, how you dress the animal out, uh, how you treat the animal before the animal is, is eaten. There's all kinds of things that really speak about the Father's love and the concern for life and lifting up life. And that, uh, that goes all the way into today with the Jewish community. So, for example, in the Jewish community today, uh, in order for them to, to uh, eat in a very uh, holy way, a kosher way, they have kosher rules, they have butchers who uh, follow these guidelines. And so you'll go to the store and you'll see on the side of the, of the package, kashrut. In other words, this is kosher and it's okay to eat. Now, the second aspect of the kosher laws has to do with um, one, one verse, one idea that is shared three times in the Old Testament. And that is that you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. You shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. Now, that's odd, isn't it? I mean, it, it just comes out of kind of out of nowhere. And if you look at the context of all three, it doesn't seem to be in context. So it makes us wonder, <clears throat> what does that mean? You know, to not boil the, the, the kid, the baby, in the mother's milk. Now, we'll, we'll look at that why in just a moment or what that could mean, but it has now come down to us today in the Jewish community as we don't mix meat and dairy. We don't mix meat and dairy. That's called a, a law or a fence. Uh, the law says you shall not boil the kid in the mother's milk. We're going to make sure we don't do that. We're not even going to have meat and milk in the same meal. We're going to make sure we obey this. In fact, we're going to have two kitchens. We're going to have a, a dairy kitchen and a meat kitchen. We're going to have utensils for both. We're going to have a period of time before we can go from meat and then eat dairy so we don't mix them. They really go all out on this in the Jewish community. And, and if you've ever been around people in the Jewish community, you know they take it very, very seriously. And no, we're not bound by that as Catholics today. But what could it possibly mean? Now, there are different theories. One theory is that this was a Canaanite practice where they would, they would boil the kid in the mother's milk to offer up to foreign gods. That's been a theory for a long time. There's not a lot of evidence for that, but that is a theory. Another theory is that, uh, is that uh, this is just simply speaking about uh, our Heavenly Father's compassion and love and that you don't do these types of things. That's a theory. But then there's been another theory in recent years that this just might be an idiom. An idiom. Don't boil the, the kid in the mother's milk. You know what an idiom is, right? It's raining cats and dogs. No, it's not. It's raining hard, right? And so I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. No, you're not. But you're hungry. You're really hungry. So when we say that you cannot boil the kid in the mother's milk, what we, what we possibly might mean by that is it's an idiom and that it, it, it speaks about, about something that Israel is doing that they shouldn't do. And if you look in the context of all three of these, um, of these mentions, so you have Exodus 23.19, Exodus 34.26, and Deuteronomy 14.21, so you've got all three. The thing they have in common is first fruits and offerings. So some have surmised, and I think it just might be this, that it is an idiom that you should not mix the old crop with the new. The old 
offering with the new. Give God your best, the first fruits. I think that's probably what it means. You probably have not heard that a lot either. But I, I really do think that there's a, there's a lot to that. So thank you for that question. That is really, really good. Okay, here's another one. What is the difference between deuterocanonical books and the apocryphal books? Excellent question, because we as Catholics have 73 uh, books in the Bible. Protestants have 66. And we've covered this in the past, that the 66 books and the 73 books, it, we don't come to that by subtracting or adding. There are two different canons, and the Catholic Church and all of Christianity up until the Reformation used the 73 books, and that is, the, they, they took it from the Greek Septuagint, the Old Testament, and, uh, and then when the Reformation came about, they opted out of that, went to a Jewish version that didn't have the deutero, the seven deuterocanonical books. Now, in the Great Adventure Bible here, uh, in the index at the beginning, there is a list of the apocryphal books. Now, apocryphal means false writings, and there were many going around in the first century. Um, and out of those apocryphal books, that's what we call those false writings, and Protestants call them false writings. The difference is they include our seven deuterocanonical books, uh, like, like Wisdom and Baruch and uh, Maccabees, they include those with the false writings. We don't. So at the beginning of the Great Adventure Bible, there's a chart there that shows you the apocryphal books and then uh, the deuterocanonical books that we consider Scripture. So that'll help you out a little bit, a little bit there. Okay, what is the difference between Israelites and Jews? Good question. We answered this uh, months ago, but I think it's good to, to, to revisit it real quickly. You know, the, the people of God were, were, were chosen by God. They were chosen by God, and they were first called Hebrews in Abraham's time, Hebrews. They, they were not called Israel until Abraham had his, his uh, uh, son, Isaac, and then Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? So are you with me? Hebrews, Israel. But then in 930 BC, Israel divided into two nations, 10 tribes to the north called Israel, two tribes to the south called Judah, Judah, all right? This is the beginning of, of, a, of an Israelite and a Jew. If you were a Jew, you came from Judah. You came from Judah in the south. An Israelite, you came from the north, even though we can kind of call everybody loosely an Israelite. Now, in 722, the north, Israel's taken away by, uh, by the Assyrians. And then in 587, Judah is taken away into Babylon, the Jews. So when you come to Jesus' period, those who are from Judah are called Jews, and people up north where Israel was, and it was reconstituted, they are, they are, they are Israel. They're Israelites, okay? It's, and later called Samaritans. Samaritans. That's good. Okay, here's a good question. Uh, does the church have any criteria for modern warfare? Now, I think, I think this question came up a lot because... Um, because there's so many wars in the Bible, and there's so much talk about harem warfare that's utter destruction, like a, a holocaust unto God, a complete, complete offering. And so what I thought I would do here is just touch on this. Uh, yes, the Catholic Church definitely has guidelines on going to war, and the guidelines call, are called a just war theory. A just war theory. Can Catholics go to war today? Yes. But there are guidelines that guide you before the war, and you have to meet certain criteria before you engage in war. And then there are just war theories during the war, how you conduct yourself. And it's kind of it's kind of a crazy thing when you think about it, right? But it's it's how you go about annihilating your enemy. Now, 
Pope Francis has really moved towards, he wanted to do away with this, no war for us, but historically there has been this just war theory, and it became very, very mainstream as part of a discussion when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, when President Bush brought us into war, uh, there was a lot of discussion. Does this meet the criteria? And the criteria was really developed by St. Augustine. And St. Augustine gives us four criteria for uh, making it okay to enter into a war, right? And you have to meet these conditions. And those, those four conditions, and you can read about this in the, in the uh, uh, I got my catechism down there. You can read about it in paragraph 2309. 2309, you can read about the just war theory. Okay, here's the four. Number one, the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain. So if, uh, if a nation is being attacked and it is an ongoing attack, if it is a grave attack, if it is a certain attack, that that's one checkpoint that uh, goes into the just war theory. Number two, all other means of putting an end to it must have been shown to be impractical or just ineffective. Okay, so if it, if it, all your efforts to to put an end to this, nothing is working. But the attack is lasting. It's grave and it's certain. Check two. Check three. There must be serious prospects of success. Uh, and the reason for that is that if there is not, the probability of innocent lives dying goes way up. And that's, that's something that we have to consider. So there must be serious prospects of success. General, how certain are you that we're going to win this war? I am absolutely certain. Or General, are you certain we're going to win this war? Well, that's a coin flip. Okay, now we got a problem, right? Now, the fourth one is the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. So when the nuclear bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were unleashed, the question was, is that just? Because we now have produced an evil that is potentially greater than what was happening in the war with the Japanese, right? So that's something that has to be considered. Now, I'm not here to tell you what war was just and what wasn't. That's above my pay, my pay scale. But I do know the criteria for it. I can study it. I can discuss it. I can pray about it. And I may have an opinion about it. But ultimately, I think we have to pray for our leaders to have wisdom when it comes to coming into a war. And then when... Um, when we talk about a just war theory during the war, then you need to start talking about uh, no dropping of bombs indiscriminately, uh, no civilian deaths, the children, the innocent. Um, we are not, we are not uh, poisoning a society that is going to uh, have repercussions for years and years and years. So when people talk about nerve gas or they talk about that type of warfare, that would not fit into a just war where we are you know, thinking of, of uh, poisoning an entire village. That is just not a part of the just war theory. So these are some guidelines. I, I leave it to you. Uh, you pray about it. And I'm glad that you asked that question because we see so many wars in the Bible and was there criteria? Yes, there was. And is there today in Israel? Yes, there is. There's criteria. Uh, and is there criteria in the United States? Yes, there is. In the church? Yes, there is. And that's the one we want to pay attention to. So, and you know, uh, there is room for conscientious objectors, you know, to say what they're asking me to do here. I cannot in good conscience do this because I know the just war theory and this particular part of what you're asking me to do conflicts with that. I can't do that. So, well, those were good questions this week. Uh, thank you so much for those. And uh, I hope I answered those in such a way that uh, takes you down the road just a little bit further. Again, if you have questions coming up next week, hashtag Ask Jeff Cavins, and I'll get to it. And keep reading your Bible. And remember, just because we're going into the last quarter of this 
it's not too late to invite someone to start reading the Bible in a year, because if they start in the November 1st, guess where they're going to end? At the end of October. And that's okay. Nothing holy about January 1st necessarily, but uh, it, it just get people into reading Scripture. Why? The Scriptures, the Word of God will change your heart. So, I encourage you, my friends, to keep at it and uh, look forward to seeing you right here on this Facebook page for Ascension, Ascension Press Bible Studies. God bless you.